Welcome to this first video in a series on anaphylactic shock. Anaphylactic shock, if defined a little bit loosely, is a potentially killer allergic reaction or killer allergy. That has two parts to it, allergy. The first part is anaphylaxis. Anaphylaxis is the opposite of prophylaxis. Prophylaxis, uh, as you probably know, is you take a medication or a vaccine or something to prevent disease. Anaphylaxis is when exposure to small amounts uh, of a medication or a food actually causes disease. So that is a severe, severe, rapid onset allergy, allergic reaction, allergic reaction. The second part of anaphylactic shock is the shock part, which in you know common terminology we we you know use the word shock to mean oh you know anything that kind of disarms us like that's a shocking news or that's a shocking disregard for public safety. In medical parlance, of course, shock has a slightly more technical meaning and it basically translates into decreased blood pressure that causes uh, problems with the function of critical organs like the brain, the heart, and the kidneys. There are others, but those are th ex three examples of uh, critical organs, such that, you know, if the shock is unreversed or profound, that's when it can be fatal. So that's the killer part of the allergy. There are a number of different types of shock, of course. Infection can cause something called septic shock. Uh, a massive heart attack uh, can cause cardiogenic shock. That's when the heart itself is having a problem pumping. Uh, loss of a large volume of blood may cause hypovolemic shock. Hypovolemic shock, where there's not enough blood in the circuit of the uh, arteries and veins in order to maintain blood pressure. And sometimes there can even be uh, neurologic damage causing neurogenic shock. neurogenic shock. So what are the main manifestations of anaphylactic shock? Well, there are symptoms, which remember, it's the patient who reports the subjective findings. Those are the symptoms. And there are signs, which is kind of the data reported by the observer. So that is considered to be more objective. I'm skirting the issue of how to determine objective from subjective, but we'll skip over that now because that's a philosophy question. So in about 80 to 90 percent of patients, there is involvement of the skin and mucous membranes. So the symptoms of that include things like itching, itching, a sense of swelling, maybe around the eyes, on the lips, the tongue. Uh, that's the mucous membranes, are the kind of moist areas of the body. Uh, redness and flushing. And of course, here there is some overlap between the subjective symptoms and the signs. So you can't really observe someone's itching yourself if it's not you, but certainly you can see swelling you can observe redness, you can document flushing. The respiratory tract is often involved as well, say in about 70% of patients. And by the respiratory tract, I mean both the upper starting at the nose and sinuses all the way to the bottom of the lungs. So patients in terms of the upper respiratory tract can complain of sneezing, sneezing, nasal congestion, uh, a kind of runny nose, or a lot of mucus, runny nose. In the lower respiratory tract, they can have a cough, shortness of breath, sometimes called dyspnea, a subjective sense of shortness of breath, chest tightness, chest tightness, and the 
correlates here for the signs can include, well, you can see a lot of sneezing. You can hear congestion even if you can't feel it yourself. You can see a runny nose. You can observe a cough. There can also be a decreased oxygen saturation. And you might hear wheezing on physical exam, which sometimes people report as well. They, if they're familiar with it, they'll report that they hear wheezing there themselves. In about 45% of patients, there is involvement of the gastrointestinal tract, the stomach, and the intestines. Patients will complain of abdominal pain. Abdominal pain. Sometimes it's very cramping. Nausea. Vomiting. And diarrhea. Diarrhea. And all three of these should put these in brackets, can be observed as well. In another 45% of patients, sometimes obviously with overlap, there can be involvement of the cardiovascular system. And this is critical to anaphylactic shock because by definition, as we said above, there is a decreased blood pressure that leads to the dysfunction of certain critical organs like the brain, the kidneys, the heart. So with that, patients may report palpitations or uh, palpitations, kind of an over-awareness of their pulse. It can be, they can feel they have a rapid heartbeat, rapid heartbeat, heart rate. They may feel lightheaded, or they may even, you know, say, I almost fainted, lightheadedness. And on physical exam, you can actually document a, an increased pulse, sometimes called tachycardia. That's also tachycardia. Tachycardia. You can see changes in the EKG. Sometimes even there's evidence of angina or uh, ischemia or a heart attack. And you can see, most importantly, low blood pressure. That's a key finding in anaphylactic shock. And then lastly, in about 15% of people, there are neurologic signs and symptoms. The symptoms can be confusion, felt confused, uh, dizzy. That can be sometimes difficult to distinguish from lightheadedness. And oftentimes, patients will report what we call an impending sense of doom, impending doom. A, a sensation like, I know something is terribly wrong, I feel like my, I'm in terrible danger, but I can't quite describe from what. It's not an obvious you know, lion in front of me or you know, an explosion that just went off, but just a, a deep conviction that something very bad is happening. And the observer can detect seizures and loss of consciousness. Sometimes patients will also have headaches. I should have added that over here. Now, what about the diagnosis? So critical to the diagnosis of anaphylactic shock is the history, a history of exposure to something that is a likely trigger for a severe allergic reaction. That's the most important source of data. Um, and then the physical exam looking for uh, the manifestations that we noted here above, the physical exam. There are a couple blood tests, but I need to emphasize here that the blood tests, while they're great, neither make nor break the definition or the diagnosis of anaphylactic shock. It's really the history in the physical exam. So among the tests that can be obtained, the concentration in the blood of histamine, if you catch a, such an allergic reaction within about 15 to 60 minutes. So the concentration of histamine in the blood. There's a metabolite of histamine called N-methylhistamine. N-methylhistamine, I'll just abbreviate that, hist, that can be acquired in the urine, but you have to collect urine for 24 hours. So that's a 24-hour urine. It takes a little while to get that back. But the most important test, arguably, is one called the serum tryptase which is a protein released by a key immune cell, and this is measured in the blood. 
and an elevated serum tryptase, like an elevated serum histamine, or an elevated urine and methylhistamine, that can help make the diagnosis. Of I see I'm out of time, so in the next video, we'll discuss the mechanisms by which anaphylaxis occur or its pathophysiology. See you in the next video.